When you were growing up, had anyone ever asked you, when you get older, what do you want to do with your life? Have you ever been asked that question? What were some of your responses? Anyone? Ooh. I want to be a nurse. Nurse? Someone say oncologist? Oh, anthropologists. All right, anthropologists. I was like, oncologist, wow. As a kid, you even knew what that was? Anyone else? Paleontologist. Paleontologist. Oh, my gosh. Maybe it's because you were watching, oh, his friends, Ross. Wasn't he a paleontologist? Not at, not at three. It was <laughs> okay, for me, when I was asked that question, you know what it was? I wanted to be a pitcher for the New York Yankees. That was it for me. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to be the pitcher for the New York Yankees. And it wasn't just me thinking it through. I would grab my glove every day, like in my house, and I would be pretending, fantasizing, that I would be pitching in game seven of the World Series, all right? And I set a major league record with 27 strikeouts, all right? I pitched the perfect game. We won game seven, one to zero, and then my teammates just carried me off the field. I mean, it was just beautiful. I would rehearse that over and over and over again in my room, just wanting to be the hero of the day. That was my dream. That's what I wanted to do uh, when I grew up. And uh, I don't know what it is. And some of you, as you think about this, you always want to do something fun, something big. You know, maybe you want to be a teacher. Some of you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it might be. But it always has an element of some level of admiration that you would want to receive from other people. That's usually what we want. That's what we want to do. And I would even say as an adult, we still pursue that. And that is something that we still desire. We desire to do certain things with our lives. Nothing wrong with it necessarily. Well, we want a certain level of respect and admiration from other people. And I get that. But today as we continue in this series in John chapter 1, we're going to continue to look at this passage with John the baptizer. And he's going to teach us that more than us wanting to do certain positions or certain vocations, that warrants admiration, what really the foundation that we need to be focusing on is that we need to see ourselves or actually orient our lives in a way where we can become a servant for Jesus Christ. Now, that's not easy to do. I will say to you today as an adult and as a Christian who's been a Christian for a while, it is actually very difficult to center your life in such a way where you see yourself primarily as a servant for Jesus Christ. That is hard. But I want to talk about how can we begin to do that? How can we begin to start seeing ourselves as a servant of Jesus Christ? Because if you can begin to do that, you know the songs that we just sang about knowing the depth of God's love for us? You're never going to fully know it if you don't see yourself as a servant for Jesus. Because sometimes, if I'm just going to be honest, you're often the master and Jesus is your servant. And that doesn't work. You're not going to know God's love for you when you see Jesus as your servant. He's got to be your master and your king. So how can we begin to see ourselves as a servant of Jesus Christ? Turn with me to John chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 19 to 34. Just pay attention to John here, all right? Pay attention and understand, like, try to, if you're reading the scriptures, and I hope you're a part of the New Testament challenge, and one of the things we're learning is as you're going through the scriptures, you've got to try to immerse yourself in, into this scenario here and just find, I hope you find shocking John's response here, all right? Let's check this out. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Now, John had a huge following. He was well known during this time, but they wanted to, they asked him, who are you, right? So he did not fail to confess, but confess freely. He says, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned them. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify this is God's chosen one. This is the word of God. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. So God, we come to you today, and I pray that you'll help us to really dig deep into this text. And God, that you would teach us, or at least we would begin to see ourselves as your servant. Teach us what that really means. And I pray that by the end of this, that everyone here, everyone watching at home, everyone in the nursery, would really want to start orienting their lives in a way where they would truly be your servant. Lord, this isn't easy, but I pray, God, that you'll help us to get there. We just thank you so much for this time. I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts in this room, I pray, God, it would be pleasing unto you. And it's in your name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 How can you and I begin to see ourselves as a servant of Jesus Christ? You ready for the first one? You got to be willing to dedicate your life to exalting Jesus rather than yourself. If you want to really get to a place in your life where you're going to see yourself as a servant for Jesus Christ, you need to orient your life in such a way where you are going to commit yourself to exalting Jesus and not yourself. Let me take you back to verse 19 again, all right? Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? No. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned them, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. The religious leaders really wanted to know who John the Baptist was. But understand, John never shared who he was. He didn't even share his name. It wasn't about him. You see, John knew early on in his life that he lived his life focusing not on himself or wanting to exalt himself. Because if there was ever a moment where he could have done that in front of these Jewish leaders, it was this time. But he didn't. He rather decided to exalt Jesus Christ. And that's key here. Because oftentimes when good things happen through us, oftentimes when you feel like maybe God is using us or whether you're at work, you're doing certain things well, you want to be recognized, right? You want to be known in some ways. And I think maybe in some ways, maybe John wanted a little bit of that. But he realized this idea that if he's going to be a servant for Jesus, he's got to focus on exalting Jesus and not himself. And that is hard to do. And you see in verse 29, once he sees Jesus, look what he says in verse 29. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John lived his life dedicating it to exalt Jesus and not himself. And that is not easy to do. Why? Because in this culture in which you and I live in, we, let's just be honest. We have an unhealthy preoccupation with ourselves. We do. It's always about us, isn't it? Like our social media only makes that even greater. And listen, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be thinking about yourself, but there is this unhealthy preoccupation with ourselves. And when that seeps in, it's very difficult for you and I to see ourselves as a servant. Now, in the Greek New Testament, that word servant is is synonymous to slave. Now, I know this country has a terrible history with slavery, but I want you to understand this, all right? So when I say that you and I have to see ourselves as a servant of Jesus Christ, we have to see ourselves as a slave for Jesus Christ. Because why does God want you to do that? Because, he, because those who truly see themselves as servants or slaves know they have a master. They do. You know that you have a master. And when you know that you have a master, you know that part of your job is to obey whatever your master tells you to do. Now, our master isn't somebody who is this tyrannical leader Our master is somebody who loves us, as Han was sharing today, as the songs we were singing, he truly loves us. And the only way we're going to really know God's love for us is when we're choosing to live our lives as a servant for Jesus Christ, 
Really, it is. Now, the disciples struggle with this as well because they want it to be the greatest. Now, if you're reading the New Testament challenge with us, I'm so excited because we have about 177 people in our church who signed up for the New Testament challenge. And yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Many of you are hungry for God's word. And you got David's email this morning. It was so good. He, he's encouraging us, giving us some nuggets of wisdom for us to think about. But this week in our reading, if you remember Mark chapter 10, remember the sons of Zebedee, right? Uh, James and John, the two disciples, they go to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, like we want to be the greatest in heaven. Like we don't care about earth. When we get to heaven, can we sit at your right and your left? Right? Remember that? Because they want to be the greatest. They do have an unhealthy preoccupation with themselves. And what does Jesus say? He says, do you really think like you can drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? And they said, well, you know what? If I can be the greatest in heaven, I'll drink it. Not really understanding what that means. And then Jesus calls all of his servants over, all of his disciples. And this is what it says. He's teaching them how they can be the greatest in heaven. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. Look at what he says. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Did you get this? If you want to be great in God's eyes, it's about you seeing yourself as a servant for Jesus Christ. That is so hard to do sometimes, and I know. It's been a struggle for me in my own life. But we have to because our master is somebody who entered into this world who didn't choose to want to be served, but he came and he served us even unto his death. That's the kind of master that we are called to submit our lives to every day. That is the kind of king that we are called to live for. And if you want to understand the depth, the height, and the width of God's love, we have to posture ourselves in that way. John knew it. And that's why he wouldn't tell these religious leaders who he was because it wasn't about exalting himself. He lived his life exalting Jesus Christ. And so will you do that today? Will you from this day forward say, you know what? I'm going to live my life exalting Jesus and not myself. Amen. That's not easy to do. When I, um, when I went to seminary, I moved out to California from New Jersey, and I attended seminary. I attended Fuller for three years. Year one was my study time. Year two was internship time. And so I heard about a church called New Song Church. It was down in Irvine, California. Now, from Pasadena to Irvine, it was about 58 miles. Long drive. That's, long. That's over 100 miles round trip. I went a few times, you know, because I've heard about it. I heard about Dave Gibbons, a senior pastor there. And I really liked what they stood for. I really thought the church was really great. It was progressive in some ways. And it really wanted to engage in culture. And it had a real passion for justice. And so I applied for an internship. Long story short, I finally got it. I was David Hosang's intern, right? I was David Hosang's intern. I was happy about that because David was a PhD scholar from Oxford. And so I thought, okay, well, I think I can learn a lot about theology from this guy. And whenever I had questions about the things I was studying, I would always bring it up to David. But I really believe going into this internship, it would only be a matter of time before they started asking me to preach on stage. I really thought it would be a matter of time that would happen. I thought it would be a matter of time before I would start teaching classes, spiritual formational classes at New Song. I thought it would be a matter of time before I started doing some pastoral counseling. I was ready to do ministry. I was like a lion, like, like caught in a cage. And I just had all this energy and passion for ministry because I've been in seminary for a year, learning theology about God, getting excited about these things. And I just wanted to just be unleashed and do ministry. And when I started my internship for the entire two years, you know what my primary role was? Administrative assistant <laughs> to David Hosang. Ask him if you don't believe me. I had to make photocopies for him for two years to make sure, because back in those days, we weren't quite digital. But like when we did premarital class, I made all the photocopies, made sure he put it, I put it on his desk by Friday so he would have it by Sunday. I would send emails to anyone in the communication card that checked off marriage ministry. I would have to connect with them. And back in those days, you actually called them too. So I would call them, right? I mean, there were times where I, I, I did get invited up on stage a couple times. But you know when they invited me? During infant baptism and dedication, I held David Hosang's water bowl. <laughs> and during adult baptism, I was a towel boy. 
I held the towel and the sandals of the people. And when they got out of the tub, I would hand them the towel and I would put the sandals down on the ground. And I'm telling you, that was the only time they invited me on stage. And I, I got to be honest with you, there were days I would walk through the hallways of that church and I felt so sorry for myself. I said, this is just, this is BS, man. I'm a seminary student. I'm learning to be a pastor, and I'm just an administrative assistant? This is crazy. I'm going to be honest. There were moments where I, wanted to, I, I was like tearing up because I felt this was so foul. This was so flagrant what they were doing to me. And in those moments, in those moments, God says, Peter, you're called to be my servant. And sometimes the only way you know that you're a servant for Jesus is when you let people treat you like one. And I had to learn it, and I couldn't learn it any other way but to let people treat me like one. It's not easy to live your life wanting to exalt just Jesus and not yourself. But that's the calling that he placed upon your life because John, the baptizer, said, listen, I don't need to tell you who I am. I'm not here for me. I'm here to exalt Jesus Christ. So will you begin to do that today? That as you live your life, as you serve this church, as people are being blessed by your ministry, as you work, when things you do, will you begin to say, I'm doing this to exalt Jesus Christ. Listen, you don't have to change your vocation to have true meaning in it anymore. To find true meaning. God can do that for you if you change your priorities. If you choose to exalt Jesus rather than doing this so that you can exalt yourself, whatever it might be, you can find a whole new level of meaning in whatever it is you might be doing if you just change your priorities and stop living for yourself and you choose to live to exalt Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. Sometimes you only know you're a servant of Jesus when you let somebody treat you like one. The last thing, second, is that we grow into seeing ourselves as a servant when we allow Jesus to fill us with the Holy Spirit. When we allow Jesus to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Now in this passage it says baptize. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Now, I want you to know that John's knowledge of who Jesus was was not this innate knowledge. It came from the illumination of the Holy Spirit. That's how John knew Jesus was truly the Messiah. And John shares with us that one of the key purposes of why Jesus came into this world was to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just talk about that because we have, a folk, we, we have such a diversity of people here. We have people from all different backgrounds. And that word baptism of the Holy Spirit is kind of a loaded word in some of your churches, right? Some of your traditions or some of your upbringings. And for some of you, it means absolutely nothing. Right? So baptism in the Holy Spirit, and I think in some of the Pentecostal charismatic traditions, they teach you that you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That means when you come to know Jesus Christ, that there is sort of this other baptism that you receive. And when you receive that baptism, sometimes you will have gifts like speaking in tongues, healing, prophecy, other things like that. Right? I get it. But you see, that's actually not congruent to New Testament. When you look at the New Testament Bible and you read it, and especially Paul's letters... Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a one-time event, and it happens at conversion. Listen, I don't know if you know this, but when you, get, when you got to a place where you finally said yes to Jesus Christ, folks, that wasn't a natural decision. That was a supernatural decision, a supernatural event. Amen? Amen. You wouldn't have known that if the Spirit didn't baptize you. You wouldn't have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and committed yourself to believe and be a follower of Jesus Christ unless there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we all were baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentiles, slave or free, and we're all given the one spirit to drink. Paul here is talking about a baptism. When you, when you look at that word in the Greek and the tense in which it's, it's, it's in, he's talking about conversion. Version. That when you and I were converted, when we said yes to Jesus Christ, we were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So the better word to use, other than saying we are to always be baptized in the Holy Spirit, is that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
that you to seek the filling, the refilling of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit leaks in our life if we're not careful. And we should ask that the Holy Spirit would fill us. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will fill us in such a way where there will be outside spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues and different things like that. But that's a filling of the Holy Spirit. You and I, if we want to be a true servant of Jesus Christ, if you want to get to a place where you can exalt Jesus and not yourself, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's too much about you. you got to seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let me just ask you, when was the last time you really sought to be filled with the Holy Spirit? When was the last time you really longed for the Spirit to fill you? And if it's been a while, can I ask you why? Why has it been a while? Because, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to even think that how can we say we follow Jesus Christ when Jesus says, I'm giving you one of the greatest gifts. We're going to learn in this in John, later in John, where Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is your guide. Like, why wouldn't we ask Jesus to fill us with the Holy Spirit? Why wouldn't we ask? Why don't we long for it? My hope is that all of you will long for it today. Because if you really want to be a servant of Jesus Christ, it's going to require you and me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've been asking for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit this year in 2023, a fresh anointing. I want to go deeper. I want the Spirit to be more active in my life, and it's important that we do that. It really is. Otherwise, I think we're just going to be filled with a lot of other stuff in life. And you know what it's like when you're filled with a lot of other stuff especially from this world and from our sinful nature. It's not a good thing. Let's be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a couple of things that really have helped me over the years to sort of get to the place where I can be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first thing I like to do when I'm, when I'm asking God to fill me with the Holy Spirit is I pray. I pray that God would fill me with the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but this is my number one prayer topic. More than anything else that I pray for every day, I say, God, would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? Amen. I pray for that. You should pray for that too. You should really pray because the spirit lives inside of us. And it's only to our degree, to how long we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, will the spirit come into our lives and have, claim that kind of authority. It's important. But the other thing that I do is I make sure people lay hands on me to pray that I will be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's something powerful when people lay hands on you and they pray that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So when was the last time that happened? Have you ever had somebody lay hands on you and pray that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you ever had that opportunity? All right? Look, look, at, look at Acts chapter 10, verse 17. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. That meaning the people. Right? So there is a beautiful thing that when you ask people to lay hands on you and pray that you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will come and fill you. It's a beautiful thing. Before I preach a sermon on Sundays, I have the pastoral staff come around me, and they lay hands on me, and they pray that I will be filled with the Holy Spirit. I demanded of them. I don't care how busy they are. I said, you got to come in the room and you got to lay hands on me and you got to pray that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I believe when two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, yes. he's there. Yes. Yes. We have an intercessory prayer team that come here hours before you even come. And they pray in this entire building. And they'll take me aside and they'll lay hands on me and they'll pray that I would be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual practice that you and I have to start doing. we got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You should ask others to do that. Last Sunday, didn't that happen during worship service? Where people were laying hands on other folks. And there was just a movement of the Holy Spirit here last week. Somebody actually got slain in the Spirit. And what that means is that they were so overwhelmed, they were so filled with the Holy Spirit, that you fell over. Right? There was a movement there. But it happens also when you ask others to lay hands and pray for you. I'm not going to say that that's going to happen all the time. It might happen. But it's not going to happen all the time. Like today, Shirley, like the pastors prayed for me. Shirley laid her hands on me. And I was like, whoa, girl. <laughs> So chill out. <laughs> chill out with that authority. I'm going to fall even before service starts, all right? But what I'm saying is you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Today you can do that. You can go back and have one of the pastors or elders in the, in the prayer station pray for you. And just pray. Just say, could you just pray be filled with the Holy Spirit? It will change your life. I promise you it will change your life. The other thing I do is I read the Bible. I read the Bible, and I, I get so filled with the Spirit when I read the Scriptures, all right? And I don't read a lot of Scripture. I just read, a, like, a chapter a day at most. And, and I'm going to be I don't usually read a whole chapter. I'm doing it now because of the New Testament challenge. Uh, I usually read, like, maybe, like, five or six verses, and that's it. And what I like to do is I just, like, I read it 
over and over. So what I've been doing this, this time around since the beginning of the year is that I read the entire chapter, and there's a lot of verses. So I'll start reading it, and what happens is that when there are verses that really, like, minister to me, I stop reading the other verses for the time being. And I just stay on those verses. And I just pause. I'll read it. I'll pause, and I'll say, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me about? And I just let him do his thing. And then I read it again. Sometimes I read it as many as ten times. Because then I pause and I wait so that the Spirit can fill me and just speak to me through a text. And then I'll finish the chapter. That's kind of my rhythm. I want to encourage you to try that when you read the Bible. But it's not about reading. It's about meditating on Scripture, right? And the great thing that you'll learn is this. As you learn the Bible, as you read the Bible, you'll, you'll be able to know better of who the Holy Spirit is. Because the Holy Spirit will never contradict the Bible. Yeah. That's the thing. And so that's what's important for you to know the Bible because then you'll be in line with the Holy Spirit even more. But reading scripture really helps. And if you haven't signed up for the New Testament challenge, you can do that on our website. Please do. Um, I also encourage you, if you're available Thursday afternoon at 1130, come to our office. We do scripture reading audially. And it's great. We'll even feed you lunch as well. Come out and be a part of that. But reading the word is a real, real key thing. And the last thing that I do, and this is the key thing, once you've sort of read the Bible, once you've prayed, you got to obey the Holy Spirit. All right, all right, all right. If you're not going to obey the Holy Spirit, he's going to stop speaking to you. Because why would God speak to you if you don't listen to him, right? Like after, even parents, don't you even do that with your kids? Like after a certain while, it's like forget it. <laughs> I'm not going to even tell you to pick up your clothes anymore. Like forget it. I'm done. You're not even listening to me. If you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, why would the Holy Spirit still speak to you? So you got to obey the Holy Spirit. That when he speaks, you got to be willing to obey. And the problem with a lot of us is that you want to be 100% sure it's the Holy Spirit before you obey. You're not going to know until you do it. And it's okay to do it and realize that it wasn't the Holy Spirit. I've done that so many times. It's okay. But oh my gosh, when you begin to obey and you do it and you realize like, that was the Holy Spirit, you start to get more in tune and more in line with what the Spirit's doing in your life and other people's lives, and you begin to hear him and you begin to discern his voice a lot better when you obey. Exactly what Peter did. I mean, Peter, if you look at the story in Acts with Cornelius, it was a crazy story. He was just minding his own business, sitting on a roof and just praying. I mean, he was hungry. And so as he was praying, what was the Holy Spirit doing? He was showing him all these unclean animals, right? And God said, eat it. And he's like, surely not I. I've never eaten an unclean animal. And God said, come on. Don't ever say something is unclean that I've already made clean. And then the Holy Spirit said, hey, Peter, there are three dudes downstairs waiting for you. Why don't you go downstairs? Peter goes down. He sees them as Cornelius and his boys. And they're saying, we came here because the Holy Spirit told us, God told us to come. You need to come back with us. He's like, all right, well, let's spend the night here because it's too far away. We'll go the next day. And so they do. And what happens? I mean, understand this. Jewish people didn't go into Gentile homes. Cornelius was a Gentile. He went into the home of a Gentile. He just trusted the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was guiding them. And he talked and preached about Jesus. And what happened? The Holy Spirit fell in that room. People were, like, filled with the Holy Spirit in a crazy way. And then Peter and the other disciples are saying, oh, my God. The Holy Spirit even baptizes and fills Gentiles. Peter got to experience something that he would have never experienced if he didn't just trust in the Holy Spirit. you got to just trust. You're not going to know if it's really the Holy Spirit until you actually do it. Because when you do it, you'll be overwhelmed by what God does. Sometimes it's you. but Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit. And the only way you're going to really know if it's Jesus or you is when you obey. I, was, uh, I go to D.C. a couple times a year, not because... I have ministry down there, but one of my closest friends, Pastor Eugene Cho, you know him. He comes here and he speaks. He works in D.C., and so he goes there about twice a month. He lives in Seattle, and a lot of times he's like, dude, I got a hotel room. Um, you can come. Let's just hang out. Like, you can work, and especially during the pandemic, we were able to do, like, you know, just I could work virtually, and I could just hang out with him at night, and we just have fun, and so I would do that a couple times a year, and last year, earlier last year, I was driving down um, to D.C. It's about a four hours, four hours drive from here. And as I was driving, I was praying. I was like, well, let me maximize my time here. Let me just pray. And I was praying. The Holy Spirit said, you need to call this one person, a friend, that, a friend that I used to attend church with back in the day before I even went into ministry in my old home church in New Jersey. And I just said, God, are you sure about that? Because, like, 
I, I haven't talked to this person in a very long time. It's going to be kind of weird that I just call him out of the blue. If I just call him out, it might be a little strange. But I just felt like, you know what, I just got to do it. So I called him. And I said, and I, can, and I can say this. I said, listen, I'm going to D.C. I've been driving. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me to give you a call. Are you doing all right? And it was like one of those God appointments. He and his wife were in the middle of a deep argument. And what they were struggling with was their son. Their son had been struggling physically with a couple things, like a long-term kind of physical issue. And, uh, and he just started going to college. But what was happening was that he was blaming God for his issues. And, uh, you know, that's natural. People usually do that, especially if they're not, you know, uh, far along in their faith in God. And naturally, we use God sometimes uh, like as a coping mechanism. We blame him for some of the hardships that we've gone through. The problem was is that the parents, like their whole happiness and joy, like they live for their son. And so if he was struggling and he wasn't living the life that they would want him to live, they would na- like literally physically just break down too. And they were just struggling. So they were like in the middle of a fight. They were struggling. And so we just talked. You know, I just shared some stuff with them and just gave them some like pastoral advice about, yo, you're too enmeshed with your son. You got to let him live his life. And, it, you know, you got to just work on yourself. And then afterwards I said, yo, can I just pray for you? And I pray for that. I'm telling you, I'm driving down to D.C. And like I almost had to stop my car because the spirit was moving so powerfully. Like, like for me and for them. And they were just overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. And then after, you know, the prayer was over, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of well off. So he said, hey, 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 do you guys need any money? Like, are you and your wife okay? Can I write you a check? I was like, no, it's okay. You don't got to do that. But he was so overwhelmed by that, he just naturally said, hey, what can I do to help you because you've helped me? All right? Get off the phone with that person. And then all of a sudden, then the Holy Spirit says, you need to call your niece. Now, listen, I love, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I love them all. But I never call them. <laughs> They're going to be like, why is this guy calling me? Like, I know he's my uncle, but why? Like, I don't call my nieces and nephew. Like, I just never do. I don't even text them, right? And so I'm like, God, are you sure about this? Like, I don't call, I've never called her, like, before. Like, you sure you want me to call this girl? He's like, I need you to call her. So I was like, all right. So I call, and I was like, I'm really sorry to bother you. But I said, you know, like, I'm going to D.C. I've just been praying, and God laid you in my heart. How you doing? And she just said, I was in the middle of prayer. And she started getting really emotional. And I was like, what's going on? And she just shared that, you know, in the Korean culture, uh, respect of elders is very important. And she had said something to one of her relatives during like a large family gathering, an elder, that they took very offensively. And uh, it caused an upheaval in the family, like a major upheaval. It's a pretty dysfunctional family. And everyone was blaming her, including her mother and father and all of that, saying, why did you do this to mess up the family? Now they don't want to see us anymore, so on and so forth. And she was so overwhelmed by that that she was in the middle of just kind of like crying and praying. And she just said, I I even thought maybe it would be better if I wasn't even alive. Because perhaps maybe it's better that if I'm not here, then maybe the family will get along better. So I just spent some time talking to her about it, and then I prayed for her. And she just thanked me. And I got off the phone, and I just said, Holy Spirit, you're just crazy, man. Like, you're nuts. I said, listen, you are so cray-cray, but listen, sign me up. Like, if this is what's going to happen, like, if you tell me to do certain things and I do, and this kind of stuff happens, I'm in. I am all in. I will obey you. How many times have the Spirit spoken to you? And you said, nah, nah, that's crazy. I never talked to them on the phone. Or How many times have they prompted you? Can I encourage you? Obey. Because when you begin to obey, sometimes it's you, yes. But sometimes it's the Holy Spirit. And when you're faithful to it, what happens, then you're going to be more in line. It's like, you know, like when you're, like our old, olden days, we used to have a radio station. You used to have the, not, the, dial, the knobs. <laughs> now it's all digital. And you had to, like, tune it to get to, the, to hear it properly. Otherwise, it would be all static. When you obey, it's like turning that knob and you can begin to hear the voice of God clearly. But if you're not going to obey the Holy Spirit, you're not going to know what he's saying to you. Several years ago, a young man walked through the doors of this church. And, um, you know, I just just saw him as an attender. He decided to go to Africa one day. And it really transformed his life. 
And I want you to watch his story because it's an amazing story of what God, an evolution that I believe of what God did in somebody who was willing to at least just see himself as a servant. So can we roll? Growing up in a stereotypically Asian American household, uh, there were a lot of expectations placed upon me. And a lot of my uh, identity had been founded on my grades. Um, that's kind of the way my, my parents raised me. That's kind of the way my, my dad raised me. Out of school, it took me a little while, but you know, I eventually found uh, a job and a career um, in the IT field. And you know, it was, it was cool. The excitement kind of wore off after a while. I don't know, it was weird, because every time I felt like my paychecks were getting bigger, so was my dissatisfaction. But I just kept throwing distractions at myself. My emotional and spiritual state when I originally found Metro was, uh, it, was it wasn't great. An opportunity presented itself where uh, Zamele, a nonprofit, uh, focused on uh, South Africa, was going on a, an ambassador trip. I figured if I can't find the answer to my questions here in America, why not travel to Africa, see if maybe God's doing something or has something for me there. So when I first arrived in Africa, I had a pretty poor attitude wondering what I was thinking, why I had, you know, decided to, to come. Um, but then we got to meet uh, some of the locals. And so we, we go into this, this mud hut with, you know, no ventilation, no air conditioning. This is really hot uh, hut where um, a group of women had decided that they were going to uh, I don't remember what they were making. It was either tapestry or arts and crafts of some sort. And um, it almost felt like I was, on, I was on holy ground. You know, that these women were taking charge of their lives, that they were, um, they weren't given any opportunities, so they decided that they would make one for themselves. And I remember that resonated with me, with me so much. And um, all I wanted to do was help them. And I'd never felt before like uh, that there was something I was supposed to do. There were other things that I wanted to do or other things that I could do, but that was the first time I felt like that's something I was supposed to do. During and after the trip, I felt convicted to find work, doing something um, that was more helpful to others than it, than it might be to me. The conversation that I was most nervous having was with, uh, was with my dad. When I told him uh, what I wanted to do, he took a moment and then he started telling me the only thing he didn't want for me was for me to live my life with regrets. And so he said he wouldn't mind if, if I was poor, he wouldn't mind if um, I had to live a life of sacrifice. What he didn't want for me was to live a life full of regrets. And so he gave me his blessing and, and since then he's been my biggest supporter. Maybe like two or, or three months after that, uh, I got a call from, uh, from Pastor Peter, and he asked me if I'd be interested in being his assistant. You know, a little bit after that, uh, Metro asked me if I'd be interested in leading their fourth and fifth grade ministry. Maybe a few months after that, they offered me their, uh, their position as a associate director of Metro Life, which is our after school uh, program, uh, working with at-risk teens in Englewood. Essentially, my role in in all these positions is the same. I get to I get to help people. You know, whether it's helping them do their job better, whether it's 
um, you know, teaching them about Jesus or whether it's, you know, helping them to, to reach goals that they otherwise would have thought impossible. And it's interesting that uh, I've never been paid less in my life, but um, I've never felt more overpaid at the same time. Um, but I feel like I'm finally doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And that brings me a lot of joy, a lot of uh, satisfaction. And so I don't, it, on the outside, it may seem like I'm living a life of sacrifice, but to me, it, it doesn't feel that way at all. I don't feel like I'm sacrificing anything because you know, what I got in return far outweighs what I've had to give up. <laughs> I still remember when Steve came back uh, from Africa, he wanted to meet with me, and it was the first time I ever got together with him. And he treated me for some sushi, so it was a good way to get me to go out and meet with him. And uh, he just, I still remember the conversation. He just said, I, I just want to live my life where I can just, you know, impact people's lives for Jesus. That's it. That's all I want to do. I don't care what it is, but I just want to do that. And that's when I called him months later and I said, hey, you want to be my administrative assistant? And then these other positions just started coming. And you know, one of the beautiful things about this guy is that, you know, he never entered these positions ever saying, well, I want to like one day run this whole church and be the man, you know? He never said that. He just wanted to serve. And it was so fun. We've been without an executive pastor for the past two years now. It's been hard to be vacant with, you know, the sec number two of the church. And there was a day where I was walking my dog, and I was just praying. I was like, God, you got to do something, man. I'm like, I'm struggling here. I can't, I can't survive without an EP. And he just said, well, what about Steve Bang? It was the Holy Spirit. And I was like, Steve? I was like, what? Steve Bang? I don't know about that one. I was like, that might be me, not you. And uh, he said, and he just started talking to me. He said, why do you think I made him get licensed as a pastor? I've been raising him up to do this. And I'm just like dumbfounded by this knowledge that the Spirit just dropped on me. And I'm walking back home, and I go through Wood Park, which is the pathway I take. And who do I see sitting on the benches on a Monday, which is our day off, our Sabbath? Pastor David Hosang. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, well, I'm here to get my car fixed. And I just thought I'd just hang out in the park. I'm like, oh, my God, how serendipitous. And I said, listen, God just said something to me that's crazy. I need you to let me know if this is a crazy idea or not. And I was like, what do you think? I told him by Steve, and he said, no, I think that's from God. I said, really? Well, let me talk to Sunita, right? <laughs> I was like, Sunita, what do you think? And he said, she said, no, I think that's from God. And I said, okay, well, let me talk to his best friend, Doug. I was like, Doug, are you okay with this guy being your boss? He said, yeah, I could see Steve doing it. And it's been a process as we've been praying through it all. And I just want you guys to know that through prayer and discernment, the elders have asked Steve to be the executive pastor for Metro Community Church starting on March 1st of this year. Yeah. If he took that administrative position and the spirit said to him, one day you're going to be the executive pastor of this church, he probably would not have taken it. He really wouldn't have. He couldn't have. He wasn't there yet. God had to teach him some things. He had to get more in line with the Holy Spirit and be finally in tune with him. And it took a few years, four or five years for that matter, but God did it. And now he's gonna be doing something where I believe is gonna help our church and take us to a place where we need to go. But it all started because he just wanted to be a servant. He just wanted to exalt Jesus and not himself. And he tried his, to do the best he can to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, for some of you, it's been hard, hasn't it? This life has been hard for you. And maybe it's been hard with God. Maybe what you need to do is you need to stop making God your servant. You need to make him your master. And you need to submit yourself to your master and say, I am your servant. And I'll say yes to whatever it is you want me to do, wherever you want me to go. Maybe you could start praying that God would fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you could begin to live your life to exalt him and not yourself. That's my hope and prayer for you, and I hope that we can all do that. And I do believe if you do, your best days are ahead of you.
with God, not behind you. Let's pray. So the question for you is, will you be a servant for Jesus Christ? Will you live your life just to exalt him and not yourself? And will you live your life longing to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Let me just let you pray to God, and then I'm going to pray for us. Father, it's not easy to see you as our master. I know we say it, but when it comes down to it, the way we pray to you, sometimes it's like we give you the directives. We give you our orders, sometimes our non-negotiable demands. And we expect you to answer it, and you be the servant. Forgive us for that. We don't truly have never really grappled with the height and depth and width of your love because we can't do that unless we see you as our master and as our king. And so God, I pray for all those in this room, all those watching online, those in the nursery, who wants to know the freedom and the peace and the joy that there is in just just being your servant. God, would you grant them that prayer today? Would you answer that prayer for them? May they live their lives just to exalt you and not themselves. May they live their lives wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit so they're not filled with anything else from this world. Help them to obey you, obey the things you might be calling them to. And if there are some here that felt like they've disobeyed you because you've encouraged them to do something and they've never done it, they've never taken that step, God, you're not done with them. Let them know it's not too late. They can start today. But God, would you teach us and help us to be your servant? Thank you that we have a master who loves us, who served us even unto the cross. And so I just pray that you'll be with her church. And God, just help us to serve you humbly. And as we do, I pray that your kingdom would be advanced. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.